So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Miguel, as they just introduced me, um, and I'm really excited to present this work that we did as part of our master project last year uh, about autonomous racing. Um, and I guess it's a fair question, um, why racing? Um, so racing was always leading in the automotive industry regarding innovation and, and research. Um, they introduced things such as the brake disc, uh, the rear view mirror, and the ABAs among others. So we think that now it's our time, uh, it's our duty in autonomous racing to push the limits of performance and robustness and to contribute a bit to the, the whole autonomous driving community. Um, and of course, there's one more reason. Um, it's very cool. Um, so please let me introduce you, uh, Fluella Driverless, the first winner of the first autonomous racing competition ever. Um, we are presenting today a real platform, real size platform, only with online uh, computing and sensing. All the videos that I'm gonna play are gonna be um, real time, no accelerated, uh, and if there was to be a problem formulation, it would be given a totally unknown track, uh, limited by yellow and blue cones on left and right, put your car on the track, and fulfill 10 laps fully autonomously without any human intervention. Uh, the faster car will win. Um, the challenge of this competition uh, is the platform. It's an extremely performant and powerful platform. It can reach from zero to 100 kilometers an hour in 1.9 seconds. Um, it can reach up to 1.7 G's acceleration when turning and up to 120 kilometers an hour. Um, to put it in other words, one light of revolution from the beginning to the end at 10 hertz, like our lighter, um, at 30 meters per second, you would travel three meters uh, forward in one light of revolution. Uh, between frames of our camera system at 20 hertz, we travel 1.5 meters, that's our baseline. Um, we also count with uh, sensor issues that we call. So basically from the moment we take the picture or the lighter shot of the cones until we receive it down the pipeline, um, we have up to 18 milliseconds. That means that we travel 2.4 meters uh, since we record data until we can process it. Um, we also count with real sensor faults and with a uh, high wheel seat. Um, on top of all this, we cannot use the cloud or outsource anything. Every process has to be run on board and online. Our contributions are that we are presenting a complete system for autonomous racing. Uh, we focus from perception to state estimation. Um, we present the algorithms that were tailored to tackle real race scenarios and real issues that uh, happen throughout the season. Um, we did an extensive evaluation on a real platform and we present the results. And then we also open sourced uh, a data set where people can use uh, the main sensors in our car to check their algorithms. Um, first of all, I'm gonna introduce the um, the sensors and actuators. So Fluella was a normal um, human-driven electric car. Uh, we had to include a lighter under the nose. Uh, we included a camera system, a stereo camera behind the empty driver's seat, uh, and an inertial navigation system. We can also have access to the previously existing sensors like the ground speed sensor and wheel odometry. To actuate the car, we have a steering actuator behind the dashboard and an emergency brake system that is passively actuated. So it brakes in case of any emergency or power cut off or anything. We use our four-wheel uh, driven motors to uh, accelerate and brake the car. The system architecture um, is based on the fact that the car is limited by, the, the, sorry, the track is limited by cones. So the first thing that we need to do is to perceive those cones, to be able to race in the track. Um, we perceive them with both um, lighter and camera, and from here we extract the cones. The problem is that in order to race to the limit, we need to know the track um, around 60 meters ahead, and our sensors cannot perceive that far. Um, that's why we need um, the mapping and localization module. So we use the output of the LiDAR and visual cone detection uh, to map it, uh, so we do SLAM. Um, but then the controller that we need to run on the car needs to run faster than what we can achieve with a SLAM algorithm. Um, so we do sensor fusion, mixing that outcome from SLAM with um, the ground speed sensor and the other odometry sensors to provide a fast, non-delayed uh, state update. We'll focus on this part of the pipeline for this paper. Um, so light recon detection, mapping, sensor fusion, and fault detection. I will explain now every module in detail. Uh, so for the lighter based cone detection, uh, we have two requirements. We want to have uh, as many cones as possible for the mapping algorithm, but we want to have an almost outlier free uh, version for the local path planner. So what we do is um, we correct for the oigo motion, um, reject the ground, uh, ground removal, and then we do Euclidean clustering for the first stage. Then for the second stage, we do a spatial and temporal filter to reduce farther outliers. So here in the video, you can see on top um, the raw point cloud. 
On the middle, you can see the first stage where you can see many cones, but also some grass on the side that uh, are seen as cones, although they are not. And then down in white, you can see the second clustering stage with almost no outliers, but also sees um, not that far uh, in space. Um, so we use this output uh, as landmarks observations um, for the mapping and localization module. Uh, we based on particle filter SLAM, so we use FASLAM since it's very robust to uh, data misassociation and missing landmarks. Um, we do an explicit lab detection, so when all the particles um, arrive to the, close to where they started and they all um, are closer to each other in the sense that um, we put a threshold on the covariance of the particles, then we assume that we uh, close one lab and that we can fix that map. Um, we do that to prevent the, the map, map correction um, and to be safer while, while racing. We also implemented landmark mutual exclusion since we know that for ob our observations, uh, we don't have two observations of the same landmark. And this also proved to, to improve robustness of the system. Um, you can see in blue the raw odometry input, in red the estimated trajectory by SLAM, in gray all the particles, and in green um, yeah, all the estimated landmarks. As soon as we come back and we reobserve geometry, uh, we can close the loop because all the particles come together, and then we can uh, estimate the right and left boundary that allows us to race to the limit. Um, for the pose and velocity estimation, uh, we need to give a fast non-delayed as update, as I said. So we use a 2D extended Kalman filter, so three states for the pose and three for longitudinal, lateral, and angular velocity. The process model is driven by the IMU, uh, and then we use an external uh, laser tracker to have ground truth of our system so that we could um, compare the effect of the delay in the system and compare different motion models. Um, we achieved a uh, root mean square error between our estimate and ground truth of less than 20 centimeters when going at mid speed, so 30 kilometers an hour, um, and less than 40 centimeters when going uh, up to 80 kilometers an hour. In order to deal with um, real life scenarios, uh, we have to implement an outlier rejection. So the one on the left, um, comes from our ground speed sensor. Um, it sometimes gives spikes when we go over reflective surfaces or wet surfaces. Uh, and we used a chi-square based method where if the measurement is um, it's not expected to be um, that far, then we will reject it. So basically with all the information that already runs in the Kalman filter, um, we can uh, reject all the outliers that are not likely to happen. Without any modification to the algorithm, uh, we can also implement it on all the sensors. So for instance, on the right, you can see um, the wheel odometry. So in green, you can see both wheels uh, reducing the speed because they block when we decelerate very fast. Uh, but they are not correct in the estimate because they are, they are rejected as outliers uh, with this outlier rejection that, that I mentioned. Uh, we also have like a health diagnosis, which is a weighted average of the chi-square test for every sensor. Um, and this proves to be a good estimate of ground truth. So the lower our estimate of health, the, the worse um, root mean square error we have. Also, um, it allows to, us to know how far we are from the limit of the estimation. So those are the two outliers for, um, for the ground speed sensor, and those were rejected as outliers for the odometry. You can see in the video how the self-diagnosis, so the health estimate is very good when we go slow, but as soon as we go faster, um, the hell decreases, especially when we break hard, because then the wheel odometry cannot be taken into account. You can also see um, in here the outlier that the ground speed sensor gave, and it was perfectly rejected, so we didn't corrupt the estimate. Um, in addition to uh, compensating for uh, outliers, we have to do delay compensation, since especially the cone and the slam output have up to 80 milliseconds delay. So what we do is we timestamp every sensor um, as soon as we get it, or as soon as it's taken, and not when it comes to the filter. This way we can introduce the measurement um, where it belongs in the filter. So we go back to the past, we introduce the measurement, and then we can propagate the filter forward. Um, but this would imply um, too much delay for consistently delayed measurements. So we do an approximation of a steady state Kalman filter. We run the ex full extended Kalman filter up to the most delayed measurement, and then we run the, the approximation um, only at the end to have a fast non-delayed estimate. Finally, um, the safety is a safety critical application. So if a human, driver, a human responsible person was to see a fault in the car and would press the red button immediately, uh, going at 60 kilometers an hour, the car would displace still 14 meters. Um, so if this fault was detected automatically, the stopping distance would be reduced to three meters. That's why we have a hardware watchdog that uh, supervises the ECU. 
Um, that's why we have an ECU watchdog that supervises the autonomous computer. And that's why inside the autonomous computer, we had a high level safety uh, that checks that every critical module is running. So if we have LiDAR or a camera, doesn't matter if one of them dies, we keep running. Uh, but if both of them would die, then we don't have observations, so we stop the car immediately. Um, last, I'm gonna show some um, autonomous racing experiments. Um, so we did a lot of testing, testing as I said. Um, this is the first discipline of the competition. It's called a skid pad. It turns twice to the right and twice to the left. And in this discipline, we are very close to human performance. We are better than an amateur driver and very close to an uh, experienced driver. And we can race even if it's sunny, uh, rainy, different groups, uh, the car reaches very close to the limit. This is in the official competition. Well, they did finish. I didn't dare say that it, did, that it was looking good, but it was looking good halfway. And they actually managed to set the fastest time of the day with a 7.5. This is acceleration, it's the second and discipline. Off. And it's about going as fast convincing. as possible. You can see the top speed hitting pretty quickly. Yeah, it's 4.37, which is the fastest time of the day so far. It's 91 kilometers an hour over the finish line. And, and this is truck drive, which is the hardest line. discipline. Uh, it was pouring rain, as you can see in the competition. The car still performed. To a halt, and that is the first time a driverless car has competed successfully in the drive track. The track drive combines uh, chicanes, straight, hairpins. It's totally unknown at the beginning, and it's all sorts of normal racing. In here, we first map the track, and then only when we have the, the lap completed, we can estimate the boundaries and race to full potential. So this is the strategy that we follow at a competition. You can see all the pipeline that I explained working together. Um, and you can see how we, we reach kind of close to human performance. Um, I would like to thank all our sponsors that support the team or have supported the team for the last uh, years. Uh, and if you have any question, I'll be glad to ask now. If you have any more extended question, please come to our poster session that is this afternoon. Thank you very much. much. Questions? Thank you. So I know that this is a yearly competition. So what do you want to improve for next year in the summer? Um, so there is a team that is taking care of this since, since September this year. We are improving every single part um, that was not optimal this year. The main thing that we're going to do is to uh, fully integrate camera and LiDAR into SLAM and benefit from having um, better depth estimation from LiDAR and better color or color estimation from camera. Um, so we hope that that makes the, the system even more robust instead of taking one input at a time. Uh, and then we're also going to improve uh, some parts in every, in every system. So for instance, control is already to uh, shifting towards a stochastic MPC approach um, and the, the SLAM is it's also going to be fast time two, and there are incremental improvements everywhere. Hi, um, just a question. Uh, how did you get the ground truth for such a fast moving car? Um, so the ground truth is taken from a laser tracker that uh, you put a device, a reflective device on top of the car and you can get the pose up to like, I claim millimeter accuracy. Uh, so then we just have to align the, the frames and, and we can compare at least the, the position, not even the heading, but uh, the, so what, what I gave is the root mean square error of the position error. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? So I have a quick question. If you translate this to, say, a dirt track, how do you anticipate it would work? Um, so basically we can tune the car to race closer or farther from the limit. Obviously, in our, we always wanted to push it um, to see what was the limit, uh, but in the competition we go a bit uh, not that uh, closer to the limit because it's about robustness, not only performance. So there is, um, you can easily tune it with the tire model. So in the tire model there's one single coefficient that scales everything uh, to see how much lateral acceleration you can get on the track. Um, so at the moment it's, it's a human looks at the track and says we can go this, this fast or this closer to the limit. All right, let's thank him once more.